Hello everyone, uh, I'm Igor Stoffa, I work for NVIDIA and today I want to talk uh, about uh, safety for the Linux kernel. Um, there will be a brief introduction and then I want to talk about uh, uh, a wish for better isolation within the kernel. Um, we will see how we could create different contexts within the kernel and how to use them and I will try to draw some conclusion and then uh, uh, show what I'm planning to do next. So this is an experiment I'm running. Uh, it's not finalized yet, but I thought I could share what I found so far. And it's about uh, uh, protecting the kernel from uh, self-interference. Uh, what I hope that uh, you can take, uh, take away from this uh, talk are ideas for uh, how to uh, cope with interferences and uh, also how to choose what to care about and what not, and possibly uh, have some ideas about uh, how you could improve your hardware or ask your hardware vendor to improve it. So everyone wants Linux. Unfortunately, Linux is not the best choice at the moment for safety, primarily because it's a monolithic kernel. So uh, what can be done currently is to try to detect uh, uh, internal interfer interferences, but there's little that can be done at the moment for preventing them, or at least uh, limiting their effect. Um, what do you find typically uh, in a safe system which is uh, using Linux? Uh, you find full redundancy, typically, uh, meaning that you have uh, multiple systems which are trying to run simultaneously. And that's, of course, expensive. Uh, so we would like to avoid it unless we really cannot do without that. Uh, you have a, a safe monitor, which is a, some sort of small system which we trust uh, uh, is very rel reliable and it's uh, in charge of uh, putting the whole bigger Linux system back into a safe state uh, should uh, anything bad happen. And that's something that probably you cannot do without. Um, then you can find the uh, hardware message passing uh, you have uh, some uh, safe uh, applications and uh, one way to uh, ensure that uh, there is no undetected corruption is that uh, this application can talk with, to each other or talk to something which is uh, outside the system uh, by using some uh, error correction, check some, something which uh, can uh, pinpoint if there's been a damage of some sort in, in the information being exchanged. Um, one technique that is used uh, is to implement the user space device drivers. Um, they are safer for reasons that we will see later, but it's not really Linux. Linux uh, mostly has uh, kernel device drivers and it would be nice to use those. Um, as I mentioned, we can have also some uh, level of uh, self-monitoring the kernel, meaning that uh, we can define uh, uh, for certain subsystem um, a sequence of states and uh, how those subsystems must uh, evolve from one state to the next. And we can try to verify that uh, this sequence, this, this graph is uh, uh, correctly uh, executed. And it's something that is useful in some uh, use cases. Uh, the problem mostly is that one has to incur in the penalty of uh, describing these states and then implementing them. Um, so can we do somehow better? Um, what I'm thinking is uh, mostly, well, let's drop the full redundancy, at least in most cases. Uh, I will come later back to this, so why I think it can be done. Uh, the safe monitor, I don't think we can uh, do without, but it's okay. Uh, Hard message passing, it's also part of the design and uh, I think it's, uh, it's acceptable. Uh, it's a acceptable requirement for the applications. Uh, for the user space device drivers, uh, well, Let's try not to use them, or at least uh, to have a very good justification for that. Uh, in kernel safe monitoring, well, it's useful, certainly. Um, maybe we can uh, focus on trying to identify which cases uh, we, we want to support. And then what I'm trying to propose is to introduce in kernel hardware barriers so that we can uh, introduce uh, uh, multiple contexts within the kernel. And the idea is that uh, this can help uh, for the points I previously proposed to, to alter. Well, why do we want barriers? 
first, uh, uh, let's just have a look at uh, uh, terminology. Uh, usually in safety, uh, you talk about a, a safe, uh, uh, safe part of the system because it's involved in, in some uh, uh, evaluation which goes beyond the uh, implementation. There's a set of uh, uh, quality criteria and uh, analysis that uh, are applied to this uh, component. QM instead is just quality managed and uh, what it means is that it's developed uh, uh, properly but it's not supposed to be involved in uh, any safe use case. So when we have a Linux system, well from a very high level view we have uh, applications which can be safe or not and then we have the kernel. Uh, applications might talk to each other through a shared buffer for example uh, and then applications uh, perform system calls. System calls are nothing else than the means that the application has to ask the kernel to do something that the application would not be able to do itself. And then we have the safe monitor that I mentioned earlier and uh, you can think about it as a watchdog for example in its simpler implementation. So either the uh, safe application fails to uh, not notify the, the safe monitor that everything is well or the safe application detects the problem and asks the safe monitor to, to do something and the safe monitor will for example power off or reset. It, it really depends what is considered to be the safe system uh, for the, that use case. Uh, if we look inside the kernel, uh, every application has a counterpart which is a kernel thread and uh, uh, this kernel thread might tap into device drivers and some of them might be related to safe use cases, some not. Uh, you always have a kernel thread as a counterpart for the safe application. Uh, then you have, uh, I don't want to call it miscellaneous, but the, the core of the kernel uh, the part which uh, deals with uh, memory management, uh, uh, file system, or what not. B basically the housekeeping that keeps the system up and running. And then you can have, uh, or you should have uh, these uh, internal monitors. Uh, notice that it's also talking to the safe monitor outside because the idea is uh, uh, the internal monitor can also be, it's like a counterpart of the safe application from within the kernel. Now, we have a, normally a memory management unit, MMU, which provides some level of uh, isolation. Uh, the purpose is that, for example, if you have a bug or some, something wrong in one application, it cannot really uh, leaves, uh, leave its, its sandbox. It cannot go and uh, damage other. The problem with the same uh, uh, event inside the kernel is that it can go and cause troubles all over the place because it's within the same sandbox. Uh, we just uh, expect that uh, one of the safety mechanisms that uh, we discussed will either detect the error or will fail to give a keep alive to the watchdog and therefore the monitor will put the system in a safe state. Of course, if the system has been designed correctly. Um, but again, can we do better? Uh, it would be nice if we could have uh, some uh, asynchronous way of detecting if something is wrong and uh, even better if we could prevent it from happening uh, so that we wouldn't even have to go and uh, expect a safe monitor to put the system in a safe state. The gain there is the fact that uh, uh, first of all we should uh, uh, have a better uh, resilience in the system and uh, because we can uh, define events which are considered to be real, uh, don't care from safety perspective, uh, we have a simpler system to analyze from a safety standpoint. And that's really a big thing, I think. So this is just my opinion. Uh, two possible solutions are uh, Either the use of uh, more advanced uh, functionality, hardware functionality like uh, a memory tag extension from ARM or uh, Cherry Morello. Uh, these options are still fairly new. They require uh, special tool chains. Uh, they're not exactly cheap or as cheap as not having them. And they also require, uh, they have a need for a tagging logic because 
tagging is useless unless I know how to apply the tags. The option B is to use uh, the MMU. The MMU is present basically in every Linux system and uh, uh, it's already there. Uh, it might be slower, but for this exercise I'm not putting speed uh, as a paramount uh, parameter. Uh, I'd rather evaluate later on uh, what uh, are the effects. Uh, it also requires uh, some coloring and guess what, it's more or less the same, I think. So in this case, what I'm referring to when I say coloring, uh, a way to classify memory allocations based on their intended content. And uh, the idea is that, for example, I can apply different properties so that, for example, QM code cannot go and um, alter or compromise uh, safe data. So the idea is we want to uh, come up with a strategy for tagging, for coloring uh, our system and try to understand uh, what are the trade-offs between uh, the granularity of this coloring and uh, the performance and possibly come up with the uh, idea of what hardware features might uh, improve the situation. So for this, I went for the MMU simply because it was already available. Uh, I could try everything with uh, QMU and this was just easier. Uh, as I said, the isolation mechanism is more or less uh, uh, irrelevant from coloring perspective. Uh, the MMU granularity can be seen as a sort of special case of uh, MT. MT typically has a finer grain. And also when it comes to partitioning, uh, I'm trying to keep it simple to not uh, overdo it. So if we go back to the system I described earlier, what we would like to do? This, at least, <laughs> that's what I would like to do. Uh, to have a safe uh, context, which is really what is associated with uh, safe application a core context uh, which is uh, supporting the overall uh, function of the system and the QM context. And the idea is that the QM cannot affect neither core nor safe and that core is also limited in what it can do to the safe context. Well, as I said, I'm trying to keep it simple, so three partitions for, for those reasons. Um, but there's nothing that would prevent having more other than uh, it's just more coding. And this is what we would like to have in an ideal situation where uh, there are limited iteration, uh, interaction between these contexts and, uh, for example, the safe context uh, might uh, affect the QM context, but certainly the QM context cannot uh, affect the safe context. Now, someone might be wondering, is this a microkernel? Um, maybe not, or at least not in my mind. Um, what I mean is the fact that uh, this is not designed to be always on feature. It's something that uh, uh, most of the Linux user would probably not even care about unless they have a safe application. And uh, it wouldn't even have to be a fully-fledged microkernel. Uh, it would just uh, try to protect those portions of the system which cannot easily be uh, detected otherwise or uh, which has a particular relevance based on uh, specific use cases. Um, furthermore, it might look like a microkernel because I'm using the MMU in its most basic implementation. Uh, if you had uh, something like uh, hardware tagging, probably it would be more transparent and uh, I will get to back to this later. So, uh, just to simplify what is the scope of these partitions, of this context. Uh, core does not belong to the typical uh, uh, partitioning that one might have uh, with uh, a safe application, but on the other hand, uh, uh, the idea is to not change too much Linux, and the Linux has so much functionality which belongs to core that I thought it might be preferable to start uh, with this approach. And uh, the reason for core existing and not being part of safe is the fact that uh, uh, safe might have additional uh, need uh, of protection even from core. But one question that can arise or might arise 
or I've seen arising when I was doing uh, security, not safety, was, well, we can just uh, fix all the code. At least for safety, uh, I don't think that's a good enough answer because uh, uh, the content of the core context is more or less uh, well defined, but what might uh, constitute safe or QM, it really depends on the application. In one application, a certain device driver might be QM, in other application it may be safe. So it's not really possible to hard code it. And the expectation is that uh, one will invest resources in the safe context. Therefore, we would really like to have the maximum return of investment in what we do, especially if you think about uh, having to revalidate uh, a code base because it has been uh, changed, because there's a kernel update. So I'm sorry for this, but just to put everyone on the same page, uh, I will try to make it as painless as possible. Um, because I'm using the MMU, the MMU is a hardware component which provides, from this perspective, a few key functionalities. Uh, process isolation, meaning that one process cannot interfere with the other one. Uh, kernel to process uh, isolation, the process cannot go and interfere with the kernel other than, for example, writing uh, a syscall. Uh, the MMU provides uh, virtual to physical mapping and the scatter gather functionality, uh, which I will explain better later. And uh, it also enforces attributes like uh, write protection, uh, uh, execution uh, properties, and uh, access in general. The MMU works uh, on a granularity which is measured in pages. A page is nothing more than a chunk of memory with a certain size. In part, it's configurable. In part, might be also uh, implementation dependent. And it's aligned with, to, to that size. Uh, all the memory locations within the same page have the same properties. This is just an example of what the MMU does. If you think about uh, the left-hand side of the uh, screen, uh, you have the virtual memory where you have a, uh, memory region which looks contiguous, but then it is in practice mapped uh, to non-contiguous memory on the physical side. Or you might have a, a physically contiguous chunk of memory which is mapped at a different address. The MMU can do this for you. Um, still looking at it, uh, but from a slightly different angle, uh, since I mentioned this uh, translation process, uh, the translation happens through the page tables, which is a way of uh, uh, implementing translation rules. Page table is nothing more than a, a sparse tree, and uh, each node of this tree is a, a page in itself. And it also encodes those properties like, uh, can I execute it, uh, can I write it, can I read it? Uh, Linux supports uh, up to five level page tables at the moment. Uh, not all the hardware does. Uh, in that case, uh, Linux has a means to collapse them. So going back to the MMU, the MMU, since uh, it performs this translation, contains uh, inside a cache, which is the translation local side buffer, it's a, or TLB. Uh, in the perfect case, uh, we have a cache heat and everything goes fine. If we are not so lucky, then uh, we get this, which is a page table walk, meaning that the MMU does not find the translation rule inside its own cache and needs to perform several accesses to the page table to figure out how to map the virtual address into the physical address. Um, so this means that, for example, if I can map a group of uh, physically contiguous pages into the uh, f from physical to, to virtual, I use only one slot of the, of the TLB cache, which is nice. If I am doing scatter gather, I will use more slots. It's called TLB pressure, and there isn't much that can be done about it because after a while the system is booted, uh, memory gets fragmented pretty badly. Um, some uh, implementation of the MMU allow, for example, to lock down certain entries so that they cannot be overwritten. If I know that something is going to happen very often, I can uh, try to prevent it from being evicted from the cache. Um, in a full uh, uh, implementation of a page table, you have uh, five levels, and this is how they are named. And uh, on the right side uh, column, uh, 
uh, it's represented the addressable other space from within that node of the of the tree. Um, in practice, if you look at uh, how a translation from virtual to physical happens, which is what is called page table walk, uh, we have the page, page here, which is the uh, reference to a physical page in memory. And then uh, we have the virtual address, and we start using combination of a, a physical address for knowing the page, and then the piece of the vi virtual address, which gives the address within the page, the, the offset within the page. And there I f we find the, another entry, which points to another page, and then we have another offset, and so on and so forth, till we get to the final uh, location we wanted to to reach, and that's the page table walk. Um, the Linux kernel already uses uh, uh, mapping properties to prevent overwriting, for example, of uh, code and constant data. Uh, what is left to protect, or what we should care about, is uh, writable data, Those, the data which is not uh, already configured to be read-only. Um, if we look at the this from, a, again, a different angle, we can see the page table, and uh, if we consider this context I mentioned earlier, uh, safe uh, QM uh, core, uh, we can see that mostly they end up somehow like this. And that's not very nice, because we would like to have something like that, where they are grouped in subtrees, because at that point, what we could do is uh, we could, for example, remove completely one subtree from the context uh, that should not access it. I, for example, if I remove the uh, subtree which belongs to or which maps the uh, safe uh, memory from the QM context, the QM context will never be able to reach those pages. And uh, similarly, this can be applied also to a portion of the subtree. Yeah, that's just the uh, representation of what I said. Um, and these are the three uh, maps that ideally we would use. As you can see, I have uh, marked with the uh, white arrow the fact that uh, there are three different routes, uh, PGT1, 2, and 3, because that's uh, how you can represent the different page tables. Unfortunately, the kernel already defines uh, its own memory map because it has regions where you can have uh, uh, init calls, uh, pointer to init calls, uh, initialized data, non-initialized data, uh, address ranges which are reserved for uh, runtime allocations and, and whatnot. So we cannot do that exactly in the way I showed. But what we can do is uh, we can uh, apply that partitioning to each of these sections. Um, for example, uh, as I mentioned, you, you can see the allocations as uh, Link time and runtime. Link time are those uh, which have a uh, known size at the moment of the linking when the banner is created, and runtime is what happens when the system is running. Um, if we look at link time allocations, for example, uh, looking at the BSS, which is uh, non initialized data, and then the data section, which is the initialized data, we can partition also those. And for example, if we define them as uh, aligned to multiple of one PMD, we can create subtrees inside, inside them. Um, the kernel uses a linker file, and uh, this is, uh, for example, how to introduce additional sections in the linker file. Um, that's kind of easy. The not so easy part is uh, how to populate the section once it has been defined. Uh, there are two methods. One is the obvious one, which is direct, meaning that I go and tag uh, accordingly all the data that I want to put in a certain uh, section. But as I said, the very same uh, data in one case might be safe, or in another case might be QM, so I don't want to go and, and patch it. Uh, one alternative method that I come up with is that uh, if I post-process the object files, I can, uh, prior to linking, uh, rename the sections that are used inside the object file. For example, I can have a list of uh, object files which needs to be mapped into safe, and I can rename the BSS and data as, as I've shown, or I can do the same also for the uh, QM section. Um, I'm not sure that it works in all the cases, but 
the method works. I don't know if uh, this will not find some counterexample in the code base where it's not enough. We'll see. Uh, for runtime allocations, I haven't uh, done uh, chemalloc yet. I just think that uh, we'll probably try to allocate different slabs. But again, I have to try it. Uh, for vmalloc, the finally good news is that uh, all the vmalloc allocations, uh, they take a uh, range where you have a start and end. So, and usually this range is vmalloc start and vmalloc end. But if we define sub ranges like uh, core vmalloc start, core vmalloc end, we can really obtain for vmalloc this sort of uh, um, nice partitioning, which then allows us to, uh, sorry, the metadata, I painted it as a core. But this is really similar to what I showed earlier, where you can uh, just prune uh, a subtree. Now the question is, uh, was this enough? Uh, no. <laughs> Sadly not, as I found out. For example, V3, most of the times, uh, uh, is performed uh, exactly when it's invoked. But in some cases, for example, if you are inside the interrupt context, V3 will just queue the memory which needs to be freed. And at that point, it will try to create uh, a linked list of uh, memory which has been allocated for whatever. I could have. Uh, started splitting all of this, but I prefer to uh, introduce a full memory map, meaning that at some point uh, I accept the fact that all, all the memory is mapped. Uh, what I try to do is to keep this, uh, uh, this map active for a very short period of time. And that's how it looks like. One of the advantages of this approach is the fact that uh, because of this, I always have a system which is, it can be used, it can run, and it can be verified. So I can always validate the fact that what I'm doing is not crashing. Um, it also can help with performance. In the end, uh, it's a choice, uh, and I think it's something that each one who's creating a safe system needs to validate or decide whether it's worth or not to convert something to full or not. Um, of course, uh, there's nothing for free. And uh, all this play with the page tables has a cost. Uh, it's required to create to flash it, flash the TLB very often. And that kills the performance. Well, maybe not kills, but it depends how much you are relying on fast content switches. If your application mostly lives uh, in user space, then probably you would not even notice it. I it depends. Um, that's where uh, hardware tagging might help, because in that case, the um, back-end implementation would not require multiple pages. It would m multiple page tables. It would require only one page table, and there would not be all this uh, TLB trashing. Um, but now that we have all these uh, contexts, uh, what do we do with them? Uh, this is how normally the boot looks like. And uh, this is how I am planning to change it, meaning that uh, instead of having just uh, one boot sequence, then we would have, uh, you can think about it as uh, three separate boot sequences, uh, one for each context, so that they cannot interfere with each other. And once you have uh, three shells, one for each uh, context, uh, then in practice it's like having three different uh, use, user spaces. Of course, uh, all of this needs to be implemented in a way that can be backward compatible. As I said, I don't want to permanently turn uh, Linux into a microkernel. Um, one problem is the, uh, the stack. Every thread uh, has a stack. The stack would be a really nice candidate for all this uh, hiding, but uh, at least on ARM64, while I was uh, trying to make it work, I realized that uh, um, the scheduler needs to have access to uh, stacks of the previous uh, thread that is, was running and the next one. And sometimes it just happens that they are not belonging to the same, to the same context. So 
how else can we protect them? Um, what we can do is, or rather why, uh, the problem with the stack and the reason why I'm proposing to protect it is the fact that it's very difficult to detect when it's corrupted, if it come, becomes corrupted. And that can happen also to your safe context. Uh, one first step is to switch to VMAP stack. This is already supported by the kernel. Um, I have to increase a bit uh, its size, but overall it's supported. Uh, what it means is that uh, you go from having a normal pool of stacks, which are used when uh, threads are created and destroyed, uh, you have uh, a pool where there are uh, uh, traps at the end, canaries, canary pages. So what it means is that uh, on the right hand side, you can see that the corruption of the stack in that case will not go beyond the one which is being corrupted simply because then uh, uh, there will be a, a menu exception when uh, the corruption tries to, to go beyond the, the page and uh, access uh, address which is not mapped. Um, other option is to also enable all, for all functions, stack canaries. Uh, the stack canary is currently enabled uh, in a normal kernel for about 20% of the functions. And it's nothing else than a specific additional local uh, variable, which is initialized uh, when the a function start and then uh, when the function end, there is a test which is inserted by the compiler uh, that the canary has value has not changed. Uh, this is basically how it works. The idea is that uh, if there is a corruption uh, is large enough to hit also the canary and therefore the, uh, the check at the end of the function will be detected. But of course, uh, you might be unlucky and you have a small corruption which doesn't <laughs> overlap the canary. Well, that, that's life. Um, other thing that can be done is to uh, improve the or uh, increase the lining uh, and the optimization at compiler level. Why? Because all this uh, stack churning also adds overhead and it's proportional to the amount of function calls we are making. So if we can make less function calls, uh, we have less churning and also we need uh, smaller stacks to allocate. Um, this is an extra strategy, which is to use pointer authentications. Pointer authentication, again, is something fairly new. Uh, you cannot assume that uh, your uh, CPU will have it. And uh, in practice, it adds a check some validation to, to the pointer. So for example, here, uh, without uh, pointer authentication, you cannot notice that uh, your return address uh, in the stack has been corrupted. With the pointer authentication, uh, you should. Um, I'm not sure if uh, for every implementation you can prevent uh, the damage, but at least you can detect it. So you can think about it as an alternative canary, which is uh, hardware accelerated. So having all these stacks uh, mapped uh, as vmalloc in practice, does it mean that we need to expose all the vmalloc allocations all the time? Well, no because what we can do is uh, we can further uh, partition the vmalloc address space so that for each context there is a sub-range uh, which is used only to al allocate stacks. So for example, in this case, uh, I have uh, a map where I have fully uh, represented the core allocations and then uh, I can also see the stack for the QM and the safe context, which are anyway protected already in the way that I just described. Conclusions, finally. Um, so far, I haven't had any showstopper. In a sense, I was hoping it would, I would find one because it wasn't exactly pleasant, but no luck. Um, there are very many places where it's possible to add some hardening. Uh, Again, if you start from the situation of using purely upstream kernel and you do something to improve uh, its robustness, you're st anyway improving the situation. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's up to you to assess if it's sufficient or what uh, doing that brings to the table. But you can think about it. 
uh, this also really gives uh, idea of uh, how having uh, proper coloring supported by the MMU would help because at that point uh, most of the problems I mentioned would go away, at least from a performance perspective and also in terms of having to rearrange uh, data here and there. Will it work for you? Well, uh, it's your judgment. Uh, I hope at least the philosophy is something that you can take home. Um, again, I think uh, we need to start uh, asking hardware vendors for a better solution that don't trust the TLB so much. Uh, but I really think that uh, even with the pure MMU approach, uh, it might be enough in some cases. It's up to you to evaluate if it's good enough for you. Uh, I'm a bit shy <laughs> at the moment of uh, publishing the code simply because uh, it's really hackish. Uh, I'm just in a mode where I'm trying to get it to work somehow. Uh, in some cases, for example, I have completely ignored the uh, abstraction that the kernel does when managing page table. Um, so in my case, I'm using ARM64 and I went straight for the uh, ARM64 way of doing page table. I should improve that. But uh, I hope to be able to release it by the end of the year and uh, publish it to, to upstream mailing list and uh, announce it in the ELISA forum. Um, and there's a lot of stuff to do next. Um, but again, I have been thinking a little bit about all of this and there doesn't seem to be anything completely impossible. The question is mostly how big will be the patch set and uh, what will be the reaction from, from upstream. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm also here presenting this because I would really like to understand uh, what is the level of interest in this approach which is more about changing the kernel rather than trying to understand if it's good enough or not. And thank you for staying with me so far. <laughs> That's my email address if you want to write or if you have a question. I do not know if there is uh, any time uh, left. Okay. Yes. If I'm wrong, but basically, uh, I think I mean, if you can go back to the I don't know if you can just manage that. <laughs> the simple diagrams, the, the one with the three ensembles, this I mean, it uh, this doesn't help. So, but so uh, anyway, this so it seems that what you've done it prevents any possible interference between the safe context and the QM context, right? When you are uh, in a certain context. Uh, uh, it sees only what is mapped and if it tries to address, like, for example, I said that uh, I am in QM context and for some reason, either malicious or not, I got an address which has leaked to me yeah. from safe and I try to access it, but the branch of the page table is just missing so I will get a MMU exception. Yes, a hardware exception, like for user space table, for instance. Yes, the yes. So, but um, now what, what I want to say is that Correct me if I'm wrong, but basically, what you have I mean, the solution that you propose, it reduces the possibility of interferences between QM and ASIO. It doesn't remove all of them because they, they can still interfere to the core uh, context. Yes, let, let me just for the sake of repeating. Uh, so the question was uh, is the interference? Uh, uh, prevention between uh, core and, uh, sorry, between safe uh, and QM, uh, but is there a possibility of uh, in, like second level uh, interference yes, through, through the core? Through the core. Uh, well, it depends. Uh, my approach is uh, to try to partition it so that, for example, if you have to do a uh, STPA or other types of analysis, uh, at least you have uh, boundaries which you can rely on because they are hardware enforced and then uh, you can analyze, analyze those and you can decide uh, uh, from where to start and, and what you have to analyze. So the idea is mostly if I can push as much as I can to QM, then I can use my energy on, on safe and also on core. Core is there mostly because if I have, for example, uh, let's say a safe application which allocates a buffer purely for exchanging data, 
once that buffer has been allocated, the core has no business with it. So it shouldn't see it in its own address space. Right. But for example, stuff like uh, the scheduler, do you want to treat it as uh, safe? It depends because, for example, you could assume that uh, if the error is so macroscopic that the external hardware monitor will notice that, hey, you're not scheduling the application I care about. Now I'm going to reset you. So th th that's really up to you how much you want to invest, uh, for example, for having uh, higher reliability. So in your slide, what you marked as core can be either QM or safe depending on the... Well, what I marked as core is something where uh, I wasn't sure how to answer, so I just marked it as core because if you ask me, is the scheduler safe or QM? I would say half and half. Again, it depends on the use case. So I'd rather start with the possibility of putting stuff there and defining the rules of interaction than not having it. Actually, initially, I didn't have core, and it was a huge headache uh, in order to be able to define uh, where should I put something. And core kind of solved my problem because uh, I could have this additional uh, uh, classification. Uh, Multicore is the default. Why don't you use a uh, hardware partitioning hypervisor? Well, because uh, first of all, uh, if you have a hypervisor, uh, first of all, it's not always granted that you have a hypervisor. Uh, that's an additional constraint. Um, what I my primary goal in all of this is to define actually the points inside the kernel where I want to change context. So at that point, what is the mechanism which supports it, whether it's a hypervisor, whether it's the MMU, whether it's some tagging, I don't care because that's more like implementation specific. If you think about it, you could have a sort of a generic version which uses the MMU as I'm doing now, and then every uh, vendor with ARM, Inter, could have its own implementation and could have uh, one way to accelerate it or not. Uh, I'm still interested in uh, at which point do I change color of the memory. A and that's not, I think, uh, relevant to the uh, how it's uh, backed. Uh, said this, in some use cases, uh, either you do not have uh, hypervisor support. For example, in ARM, you might not have EL3. Sorry, uh, EL2. Uh, or you might have uh, something else. And I have to stop, uh, I, but I'm happy to continue the discussion later in the corridor. Thank you.